guys welcome to another video you've got mr everything english and today we are going over everything that you need to know about an inspector calls first things first guys we will go over every single chapter and recap what happens in the play because if you don't know what the play is about or what happens in the play then you pretty much stuck because the rest of the video won't really make sense once we've been over the key events guys then we will go over the key quotes the key quotes that i will cover are quotes that in my opinion can be applied to lots of different questions then we will be going over the context the background we will be covering capitalism and socialism we will be coming freud and the id and we will be covering patriarchy those are the three contexts that we shall cover then i will go over every past paper question over the past 5 6 years and i will predict what i think may come up this year and then finally guys i will show you guys how to plan and write a question on an inspector calls in your exam now let's begin with a summary of act 1 2 and 3 the play begins with the burling family and the head of the burling family is mr burling and this is a rich powerful capitalist man and alongside mr burling we have his wife mrs burling who is also known as sibyl burling these two are the heads of the burling family now they have two children they have eric burling and they have sheila burling now eric burling is a bit of a lost cause at the beginning of the play the kid's a bit drunk he's not a kid he's in his 20s he's a bit drunk he's a bit all over the place doesn't really know who he is he's half shy half assertive the guy's a bit confused then we have sheila burling sheila burling guys pretty much lives up in the cloud she thinks life is perfect she <coughs> She thinks the world is perfect because she lives in her lovely little bubble that has been created with money and wealth and power and status. So for her everything in the world is absolutely lovely. Now, the play begins and we are at an engagement and the engagement is between Sheila Burling and a man called Gerald Croft and Gerald Croft is from another rich powerful family. Gerald Croft is rich and powerful. Mr Burling is rich and powerful. So this marriage this union is a union of wealth is a union of power. So guys the play begins and we are celebrating the engagement of Sheila Burling to Gerald Burling and they are having the time of their life. And very early on guys we learn that Mr Burling thinks that he is the most important character in the whole play. He thinks he is amazing. Now for us to understand Mr Burling we must first pause and understand a few things. This play was published in 1945 meaning the audience that watched this play watched it from 1945 on and they knew history naturally of what happened before 1945 this play was published 1945 this play was set in 1912 it was set 2 years before world war 1 that's the only context that i would like to tell you guys for now In the opening guys Mr Burling he is taking center stage and this guy does not be quiet and he comes out with crazy remarks he says stuff like war is absolutely never ever going to happen and that the titanic is unsinkable absolutely unsinkable now from the very beginning of the play Priestley creates an impression that this character Mr Burling this guy who thinks he knows it all because he's surrounded by yes men because he's rich and powerful he actually has no clue about how the world works because when he says that war is never going to happen the audience are sitting there laughing because they know mate two years later quite a big war happened world war 1 happened and that is called dramatic irony and then when he says that the titanic is unsinkable absolutely unsinkable it was one of the biggest shipwrecks in history again dramatic irony so priestley sets a precedent from the very beginning of the play that this guy on stage who's talking a lot don't be fooled by his words he actually hasn't got a clue therefore guys by taking a jab at mr burling priestley is taking a, a jab at what mr burling represents mr burling represents the ideology of capitalism it's the engagement and gerald gives sheila a ring and this ring sorry guys i think the ring goes on this hand i think correct me if i'm wrong but i think it's sad uh so sheila gives no gerald gives sheila a ring and that ring symbolizes power symbolizes control because the moment sheila takes the ring and puts it on she now belongs to gerald she's now his this ring is a symbol of control and this ring is important because in later later in the play in act 2 she takes it off and she gives it back to him and she becomes free but at the moment gerald she puts it on 
and Gerald now controls it. And in that whole part of the play, we get some inclination that Gerald has been up to some madness. Gerald has been up to no good. Because we get an indication that she says that last year, all of summer, you never came near me, which implies that if he never came near her, who was he going near? And that kind of dies away. Gerald gives her the ring. And Mrs. Burling says to Sheila that, look, you need to accept that he's a rich guy. My husband's a rich guy. And rich men sometimes have to work a lot. So just know that you're a housewife. Just know your role and do what needs to be done. And then the ladies leave the scene. And when the ladies leave the scene, we have our three male characters on stage. We have Mr. Burling on stage, we have Gerald on stage, and we have Eric on stage. And at this point, Mr. Burling takes the opportunity to puff his chest and teach these young boys a lesson. He tells them, guys, 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 did you know that a man must make his own way in this world, must take care of himself, and then after he's taken care of himself, he must take care of his family. We don't worry about community. We don't worry about society. What everyone else does isn't our concern. Mr. Burling, at that moment in the play, he defines capitalism. He is a true capitalist and he is teaching his son and future son-in-law exactly how they should be. And just when he is talking about capitalism, he begins guys cussing socialism. He calls them cranks, he calls them weirdo, they're crazy. Just at that moment, knock, knock, knock. The socialist character, the inspector ghoul, knocks on the door. The timing is perfect. The timing is perfect. Have you guys ever been in a situation, right, where somebody is talking nonsense about somebody else? They're back chatting about somebody else. And that person walks in and they shut up, they zip it. That's exactly what happened to Mr. Burley. Mr. Burling was talking nonsense about socialism. Mr. Burling was talking nonsense about the way those people live. And just as he was in his element, knock, 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 in comes Inspector Ghoul. It says in the quote, guys, there was a sharp ring of a doorbell. Going forward, this sharp, the word sharp is repeated a lot in the stage directions. And the analogy I use is Mr. Burling is a tree. The inspector has an ax and he is taking blows at Mr. Burling, chopping, chopping, chopping until Mr. Burling eventually falls. This is the first blow. The inspector arrives and the inspector tells them, hello guys, how are we doing? Actually, no, he doesn't say hello guys, how are we doing? I'm just saying that. But he says to them, there has been a death. There has been a death and a young girl has died by committing suicide. And rather than saying, oh my God, what happened? Is she okay? Can we do anything to help? Mr. Burling's like, yeah, and what do you want? Again, showing his capitalist nature. He doesn't care about other people. And Mr. Burling tries to intimidate the inspector. He kind of says to him, look, I know your boss and I know who you work with. So be careful how you speak to me, be careful how you talk here. But the inspector guy doesn't bat an eyelid. The inspector is strong, the inspector is calm. The inspector kind of keeps his ground. Socialism versus capitalism, the fight has begun. So the inspector reveals guys that the girl who committed suicide, her name, the girl who died, her name was Eva Smith. And Mr. Burling in the beginning says, who? I have never heard of anybody called Eva Smith. But this Mr. Porcupine tells a porcupine, is that even a thing? I need to cut this part out of this video. Um, guys, Mr. Burling tells a lie and we learn that he does in fact know Eva Smith because Eva Smith used to work for him. However, he sacked her because she wanted more money and obviously as a capitalist man, he isn't gonna pay her anything. So Mr. Burling, cut a, short story, cut a long story short, Mr. Burling sacked Eva Smith and that was how he knew her. Debate, is it wrong for him to sack Eva Smith? Yes or no? Is he entitled to run his business how he wants? The inspector would say no because the inspector says that Mr. Burling started a chain of events that ultimately led to her suicide. But the first chain, the first domino to fall was the fact that Mr. Burling sacked her because she wanted more money. Number one. 
At that time, guys, Sheila Berling comes back into the room and she is the second character to get questioned. And we learn, guys, that Sheila Berling does know Eva Smith and she, in fact, met her at a store called Millwoods. Now, Millwoods, guys, isn't like a JD Sports or a Primark. Millwoods is your upper class shops. Now, I don't know, Harrods maybe, but it's a really posh nice shop where the rich people shop and Eva Smith got a job there. Now we assume that she probably got a job there because of how she looks, because she's pretty, she's beautiful, she fits into that environment. So Eva Smith got a job at Millwoods and Sheila Berling went there to do some shopping. And again, cut a long story short, Sheila Berling also gets Eva Smith sacked because she feels as though Eva Smith was mocking her in the shop. And so she complains to the management that look, Either you get rid of her or I tell my daddy to close the account. Now the shop, Millwoods, has to choose between a worker and Mr. Burling closing down the account. The power of capitalism always outweighs the power of justice. So they sack Eva Smith, goodbye, see you later. We can replace you with another worker, just the way Mr. Burling replaced you with another worker. And we are going to keep your father's account. Sheila Burling gets Eva Smith sacked. So domino number one, Mr. Burling sacks her. Domino number two, Sheila Burling gets her sacked from Millwoods. Then, at the end of Act 1, guys, Gerald and Sheila are talking, and when Gerald learns her name, that Eva Smith changed her name to Daisy Renton. Um, so Eva Smith, she changed her name to Daisy Renton, and the inspector tells the character this, and Gerald gives it away on his face that he knew someone called Daisy Renton. And Sheila clocks this, um, at the end of Act 1 and she says to him, look, you might as well tell the truth because he's going to get it out of you anyway. He's like, shush, 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 be quiet. Act ends, guys, and then Act 2 begins and Act 2 begins with Gerald Burling being questioned. Now, Mr. Gerald Burling, what a hero, guys. My man is a hero. The story goes as follows. How did Gerald know Daisy Renton, Eva Smith? Same person, two different names. So, uh, Gerald says that he saw, he saw Daisy Renton. So guys, from this point onwards, Daisy Renton, when I say that, is Eva Smith, it's the same person. But Gerald says that he met Daisy Renton at the Palace Bar. Palace Bar, guys, is essentially where women go to get picked up by rich men who will pay them pretty much for sex. And Gerald says, look, I went there and I saw that Alderman Megati was cornering um, Daisy Renton. And at this point, the other characters, Mrs. Burns are, what? Alderman Megati? Is this what he's doing? Is she clueless? She is calling out Alderman Megati for doing that. But she's not asking Gerald, um, what were you doing there in the first place? You're supposed to be getting married to my daughter. Flies over her head conveniently. She's too bothered about Alderman Megati, but she can't see what's happening in front of her. Again, typical capitalist. Then, Gerald says that, look, Alderman Megati was cornering her, so me being me, me being the hero, I said, listen, my friend, she's with me. Again, guys, not in the, with those words I'm paraphrasing, but basically, guys, Gerald takes her away, gives her food, he houses her, and he takes care of her, and it's an unspoken agreement that, look, I'm going to give you housing, I'm going to give you food, I'm going to take care of you. In return, you become my mistress, which basically means you have sex with me. That was the agreement. That is how Gerald got to know Daisy Renton, Eva Smith. He essentially had an affair with her. When they asked Gerald, did you love her? This is very important. When they asked Gerald, did you love this woman? Gerald stays silent. Gerald stays silent. And my rule is that no means no. If you've been like, let's say someone says to you, did you punch him in the face? If you didn't do it, you're going to shout no straight away. But if you did do it, you might stay quiet because you might be ashamed or you might not want to admit it. You might not want to lie. So when Gerald says nothing, I would argue at this point, it reveals how Mr. Croft is a victim of capitalism because there is no way he can admit Mr. Gerald Croft, rich, young, powerful man, comes from a rich, powerful family that he loved a woman that he picked up in a bar. Is it gonna happen? So Gerald Croft is a victim of capitalism because he had to marry somebody 
rich and powerful rather than maybe somebody that he actually loved from his heart. So guys, at that point, Sheila Burling is now changing. She is becoming more powerful. Sheila Burling takes off her ring and she hands it back to her fiance. She hands the ring back. The ring is a symbol of control. She is now free and she hands the ring back to him. Gerald is done. Gerald is the third link in the chain. Gerald is the third domino to fall. Number four, guys, in comes Mrs. Burling. And Mrs. Burling is in some mad mood. She thinks she's so bad, guys. She walks in, right? And she's like, look what you want. Who are you? We didn't do anything. And they're looking at her thinking, listen, he's just battered all of us. You need to be quiet or you're next. So we learn, guys, that Mrs. Burling um, owns a charity. And this charity that Mrs. Burling owns is specifically set up to help women, young women, who are in need of help. And Eva Smith, who became Daisy Renton, went to this charity for help. And when they asked her, what's your name? She said, my name is Mrs. Burling. And Mrs. Burling being Mrs. Burling, she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There is only one Mrs. Burling around here. How dare you use my name? Blah, 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 blah. So Mrs. Burling refuses to help her. But what was the problem with Eva Smith, Daisy Renton in the first place? We learned that she is pregnant and she has nowhere to go and she has no one to help her and she's poor. And they first asked, look, this is not Gerald's kid, is it? And the inspector says, no, it's not Gerald's kid. Few, 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 few. We dodged a bullet. And then Mrs. Burling goes ham. Mrs. Burling tells the inspector that, look, I, sorry, Mr. Burling guys tells the inspector that the person to blame, the person that should be questioned about all of this is the guy that got her pregnant, is the baby father. And she says it should be made public news and he should be a scandal of in the public and everyone should know who he is because he is the one to blame. You sure? She said, yep, 100%. He is the man to blame. And then at the end of the act, Sheila wakes up because she realizes, hold on a second, He's questioned everyone, but there's one character left. There's one character left. So he's probably the one that got her pregnant. Mr. Burns didn't get her pregnant. Gerald didn't get her pregnant, but there's one character left. So guys, act two ends, act two ends with Mrs. Burling saying that, look, it's the guy's fault who got her pregnant. He is responsible. And in comes Eric Burling, guys. And Eric Burling, boy, oh boy, this guy has been up to a lot. We learned that Eric Burling is the one that got her pregnant. Eric Burling also met her at the Palace Bar and Eric Burling went with her home. And we learned, this is interesting guys, this is where the rape allegation comes. We learned that as Eric Burling was entering her home, she didn't want Eric to come inside. And Eric said that, look, I was in a mood where a guy easily turns nasty. Now remember one thing guys, Eric Burling is rich and powerful. For her to deny him, it's unheard of. So she lets Eric in, they do what they do, she gets pregnant and Eric begins to give her money. And she takes the money and then she learns that Eric is stealing the money. And she says to Eric, look, I can't take any more of your money. Peace out, see you later. And Mr. Burling, being the lovely, caring father he is, and being the just man that he is, he doesn't care, not one bit, that Eric has been sleeping around with this chick. He only cares about this money. He wants to know, where did you get this money from? What a disgusting man that he is, guys. He doesn't care about what his son's been up to, rather he cares so much just about the money. We learn that Eric was stealing the money from his dad's business and Mr. Burling says, you will make sure you pay every single penny back. And then guys, the inspector leaves and he, before he leaves, gives a famous speech saying, look, one Eva Smith is dead, but there are thousands of Eva Smiths. And if you guys don't learn, you will be taught in fire, blood and anguish. I argue it means two things. One, it could mean world war. Two, it could mean hellfire. But look, he basically says, look, you guys may get away with what you do now because all you do is commit moral crimes, not legal crimes. 
So you may get away with it, but your punishment is coming. Your reckoning is coming. If you don't fix up, it is on its way. They leave, guys. Sorry, the inspector leaves and the characters have a bit of a back and forth. Um, Sheila Burling calls out her parents saying, you guys haven't learned anything. You guys haven't even understood or accepted what you guys did. Her parents come back at her saying, look, we didn't do anything. It's not our fault, blah, blah, blah. Gerald comes in and Gerald says, I just found out that that inspector, Inspector Gould, isn't even a real police inspector. So our hands are not guilty. We are free. Sheila Burling and Eric are like, what are you guys talking about? He may not be a real police inspector, but your crimes, your crimes still stand. You sacked her for more money. You sacked her from Millwoods. You had an affair with her. You treated her unjustly when you did not give her money in the charity or help in the charity. Eric, you had sex with her multiple times. You got her pregnant. And again, you left her abandoned. You all committed crimes, but you don't care. They say, sorry, we don't care. Um, and then as the end of the play approaches, the phone rings for a second time. And this is the true punishment coming because they did not change fully, because they, don't, they did not see the error of their ways, this phone rings and they are told that now a girl has died and an inspector is coming to their house. The way I interpret that, guys, is that the first inspector was not a real inspector. He was the embodiment of a second chance. He was the embodiment of socialism. Look, fix up. Fix up and your punishment, you will avoid it. But because they did not, their punishment arrives. And that is the entire play an inspector calls. I hope you now understand what the text is about. Now guys, let's move on to context for our text. The three pieces of context that we're gonna use for inspector calls are capitalism, patriarchy, and Freud and the id. Let's go over all three of them. And guys, as you should be aware, these three come under A03 in our exam. What is capitalism, guys? Capitalism is essentially an ideology. What is, guys, what is an ideology? An ideology is a belief. Now, what does cap what do capitalists believe in? What do they think? According to a capitalist, guys, the most important thing in life is money and is you, as in themselves. They care about themselves and they care about money. So Mr. Berling is a true capitalist. Eric Berling, when the way he behaves is a capitalist. Gerald, the way he behaves is a capitalist because they care about themselves. They don't worry, this is Berling as well. They don't worry about the consequences of the actions. They do what they want. Mr. Berling sacks her because he doesn't want to pay her more. Now guys, when you want to view capitalism, you want to view capitalism as this lovely triangle. Now at the top of the, cat, at the, top of the triangle is Mr. Berling. At the bottom of the triangle are all of his workers. For example, Eva Smith. And what does this necessitate? That in capitalism, you unfortunately need poor people. Why do you need poor people in capitalism? Because it's the poor people that make the rich people more and more money. But the important part is this, the pyramid is really wide at the bottom, which means that these workers are replaceable. You sack one, you replace them tomorrow. That is why Millwards sacks her very easily. That is why Mr. Burling sacks her very easily because she is at the bottom of the food chain. They care about the top. They care about the people that make money. So Millwoods cares about the bottom line. Mr. Burling cares about himself. So a true capitalist guy only cares about himself or herself and cares about money, cares about profit. And this dictates everything. It dictates how they treat other characters. Now, capitalism guys, in this book, there is a fight. It is capitalism versus socialism. And socialism, guys, in this text is represented by Inspector Gould. And Inspector Gould, guys, he is our socialist character. Now, what is socialism, guys? Socialism is basically the belief that we should all be equal and we are all one body and that we should all care for each other. And we shouldn't have too much money, we shouldn't be poor, but everyone should live on a very equal footing. I'm gonna just make a note, guys, the idea of community. And I'll make a note of equality, but it doesn't mean literally everyone is the same. It's the idea everyone is similar. And the important part here, guys, is the idea of community. For socialists, for Inspector Gould, 
They believe that everyone was linked. So for example, Mr. Burling is the one that sacked her. Because Mr. Burling sacked her, she then went to Millwoods and then, he, uh, then Sheila got her sack from there. Because Sheila got her sack from there, she went to the palace bar and that's where Gerald met her and so on and so on. So they believe that everyone is linked to everybody else. That is why when she commits suicide, he say, the, hold on, you all played a part. We are all linked. We are all one community. And that is a socialist belief. But the capitalist belief is, listen mate, do one. We are not all a community. We are not all responsible. I am only responsible for myself. I don't care about other people. Guys, that is the capitalist idea and it is the idea of capitalism versus socialism. Socialism, guys, is embodied by Mr. Gould, Inspector Gould, and capitalism is embodied by Mr. Burling and the other characters, but Mr. Burling is the main one. Then we move on to patriarchy. Patriarchy is the second context you can use for this text. Now, what is patriarchy, guys? Patriarchy is essentially a society dominated by men. It is a society dominated by men, and as a result, women are not weak, but women are weaker. There's a difference here. And women are sexualized. That is why in this book, guys, for example, when we meet Sheila Burling, Sheila Burling is described very, very early on. The first few words describe her as being pretty. And she keeps asking, was Eva Smith pretty? Was Eva Smith pretty? It's as though how sorry she feels for her will depend upon if she was beautiful or not. Because in a patriarchal society, the importance of women comes down to how beautiful the woman is or the woman is. So guys, it was dominated by men and women were weaker and, and women were sexualized. Now I want you all to talk about this. When you add capitalism to patriarchy, then it becomes what? It becomes dangerous. It becomes dangerous. How? Look at the world we live in today, right? You've got celebrities who do stuff and they pay off the victims and say, look, don't talk about it. Don't take it to court. Here's 25 grand. Here's 50 grand. Please be quiet. That's capitalism plus patriarchy. In a patriarchal society, guys, men are dominant. But the most dominant, the most dangerous man is a, is a patriarchal capitalist man, is a man who's rich. Oof, then you're dangerous. No one cared what Gerald did. No one cared what Eric did. They're untouchable. Because in a capitalist society, being a man and being rich gave you extreme power. That is why capitalism plus patriarchy made you dangerous. But I want you guys to also argue that it also, you can argue, had the reverse effect. Why was Eric drunk half of the time? The guy didn't have a clue what was going on. Why could Gerald not speak up when they asked him, did you love her? Guys, why are they victims? Because in a patriarchal society, in a capitalist society, they must follow. They must live by the rules of patriarchy and the rules of capitalism. Now, what are the rules of patriarchy? The rules of patriarchy are as follows. As a man, you don't marry weak women. You don't fall in love with weak women. You are powerful, therefore your wife is powerful and strong. Then as a rich capitalist man, you marry and you love and you uphold the family name and you build the business and you take it to new heights. And that's why they struggle. Eric is half shy, half assertive. Eric is squiffy for most of the play. Why? Because Eric is stuck. He knows he has to follow his dad's footsteps, but the kid can't do it. The pressure is too much. He's a victim of the very ideology that gives him power. Mr. Gerald Croft is the same boat. Can you imagine Gerald Croft taking Eva Smith home to his parents, saying, look who I'm marrying. His parents, the Croft family, aren't even happy that he's marrying Sheila Burling. Hence why they didn't come to the engagement. Let alone bringing home Eva Smith. That's not going to be accepted at all. So guys, you want to argue, you can flip it on his head and the idea of being victims. So guys, that is patriarchy and that is capitalism. And then we have the last piece of context, which is the flavor of the month. Everyone is talking about it. Freud and the id. Now guys, I've been over this in so many videos, but just in case this is the only video of mine you watch, I will give it to you how it should be done. Freud guys, he wrote about the human brain and he said that the human brain has three parts. And he said that the brain has three parts. One is called the id, 
One is called the ego and another part is called the super ego. Now, for the sake of this video, guys, the only part of the brain that we care about is the id. Now, what is the id? The id, guys, is our desire. The id is our raw instinct. And he said that as human beings, we have multiple instincts. But the only instinct that we care about in this video is the instinct of worship. Now, this worship can be worshipping God. This worship can be worshipping money. This worship can be worshipping people. This worship can be worshipping cars. People worship something. Mr. Berling worships money. You can argue Eric, the way he treats Eva Smith, he worships his desire. So every character lives by their instinct, lives by the instinct of worship. The moment Mr. Berling sacks her, the moment Sheila gets her sacked, the moment Gerald sleeps with her, the moment Mrs. Berling doesn't help her, the moment um, Eric has sex and treats it like an animal, they are slaves to their id. The characters are slaves to their id in one way or another. And you can argue that their id impacts how they treat other characters. And these contexts can be mixed and matched. You can argue that because Mr. Berling is a capitalist, Mr. Berling is, an, is his id worships money because he's been told that that's what you're supposed to do because eric is a patriarchal man who lives in a capitalist family he believes look women aren't that important women, women shouldn't be respected women don't have much value therefore his brain tells him that when you see a woman you can do whatever you want hence why he treats her the way he does but guys these are three contexts that you can use you decide which one you're going to use or which two you're going to use. But these are three easy peasy contexts that you can use. Other stuff that you can talk about is the dates. For example, I mentioned earlier, the play was written in 1945. The play was set in 1912. It was set before World War I. And you can talk about the idea of how the writer uses history to his advantage. But these are three very good pieces of context that you can use in your exam. Now, guys, let's go over the key quotes. Guys, after looking at context, let's now look at a few key quotes. Now, there are many key quotes. I've got videos on top 10 quotes for Inspector Calls. But in this video, guys, we're going to go over three to four quotes that can be applied to lots of different questions. The first one is, a man has to make his own way, has to look after himself and his family too. Now, in this quote, guys, the two devices that we are going to be speaking about is rule of three and is repetition. Now, the context that we can apply to this particular quote is the idea for now of capitalism. And if you want to go there, you can even link it to Freud and the id. Let's explain how. What does this quote show? This quote emphasizes the idea of importance. Mr. Burling is telling Gerald and is telling Eric, look, guys, as a man, he emphasizes man, as a man, you must know your priorities. You must know what is important in life. And he literally sums it up. He says, as a man, you must care about two things. This one doesn't matter. He says, care about two things primarily. Number one, first, you must make your own way. And this guy, I view him as a bulldozer. He keeps saying he's a hard-headed businessman. It's the idea of a bulldozer. You charge, you make your path, and you don't care about collateral damage. You don't care about who you hurt in the process because all you care about is your path because this will allow you to look after yourself. How? What does he mean look after yourself? He is talking about financially, guys. He is talking about money because for Mr. Berling, looking after yourself depended upon how much money you had. So the first thing you do is you build and you work and you work and you work. Second thing you do is you look after yourself. There's no sign about anybody else. He doesn't mention family yet. He doesn't mention friend or community. He says, essentially, do what you have to do to become rich, to look after yourself. Then there's a pause that is used here, guys. There is a pause that is used. And this pause, number one, is beautiful. But number two is quite funny. It's as though at this moment of his lovely speech, Mr. Berlin realizes, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm talking to Jerry, I'm talking to Eric. Let me just add in family. Family here, guys. Where's family? Guys, family here is an afterthought. 
Mr. Burling realizes, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just add in family because I don't want them thinking I'm too selfish. So he says, yeah, and your family too. It's an add on at the end. So you want to make a point that Mr. Burling here makes it clear. He makes it absolutely clear that even though this is a rule of three, out of the rule of three, he only cares about two of them. The last one is an add on. The last one is like he's saving face. He's saying, you got to do what you got to do to get rich. And when you've done all of that, then worry about your family. Guys, this quote is perfect when it comes to talking about capitalism because it literally embodies that. It embodies the idea that a man should worry about himself and money. And that's the only thing we should worry about. And that is why it also links to Freud and the id because he makes it clear that as a man, what do you worship? We don't worship um, um, poverty. Sorry, we don't worship helping other people. We don't worship love or affection. We worship one thing. And that one thing is yourself. And you do everything in your power to make sure you are successful. And that is how I would discuss that quote. Now, this quote can be used to talk about Mr. Burley. This quote can be used for capitalism. It can be used for socialism. It can be used to talk about the relationships between the characters. It can be used to talk about gender because it literally tells you why men were the way they were and the views they hold. This one quote can be used for about five different questions and probably more. But that is quote number one complete. And then directly beneath, guys, we have the opposite. We have a quote that is said by Inspector Gould. And this quote, guys, is a metaphor because Inspector Gould is comparing human beings, is comparing community to one body. And the important part here, guys, is what? From this quote, whilst we have capitalism over there, we have socialism over here. This is the direct opposite of the quote above. Now, what is Mr. Gould or what is Inspector Gould saying in this quote? Guys, in this quote, Inspector Gould is making it clear that you can't ignore other people. You can't neglect other people. Why? If one part of your body hurts, your entire body hurts. And that is what he is saying here. We are members. We are members. We've signed up to a club. And together we form a body. And this body can only work if everyone who's in the body works together. One weak link. If your finger hurts, your whole body is going to hurt. One weak link and we fall apart. So guys, he emphasizes here the importance of what? He emphasizes the importance of community. And this quote directly contrasts the quote above. It completely goes in the opposite direction of what Mr. Burling has said. Mr. Burling is going on about how a man must make his own way. A man must take care of himself. Mr. B the, sorry, the inspector is like, uh-uh, we are all in this together. Now, this quote can again be used for capitalism, socialism. It can be used for Inspector Gould. It can be used for every character. You can argue that this quote is why the other characters do what they do. Mr. Burling, Sheila, Eric, Gerald, all do what they do because they don't view themselves as a body. They view themselves as separate. They don't view themselves as a collective unit who is accountable. And this quote can be used for that. So guys, so first one done, second one done, and then we have unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. Guys, this quote, you wanna use number one, that it is dramatic irony. That is the first place that I would use it, guys. This quote is dramatic irony. And then if you want to go there, guys, you can talk about the repetition of the word unsinkable. Now, what is this quote referring to, guys? This quote is referring to the sinking of the Titanic. And that is why it is dramatic irony. However, and in, actually, you know what, guys? Let's take it further. I want you guys to also talk about in this quote the idea of symbolism. Now, there's a lot here to unpack, so let's do it. Unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. First things first, guys, the basic analysis of this quote is that it is dramatic irony. Now, why is it dramatic irony? It is dramatic irony because Mr. Berling is saying to the audience that the Titanic will never, ever sink. 
and the audience are aware that this ship does sink. So it's dramatic irony because the audience are aware of events that characters on stage are not. But there's a bigger play to be made here. There's a much bigger play to be made. Unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. This thing isn't going to go down. This thing is never going to sink. Why is he so confident? Why is he so confident? He is so confident because for people like Mr. Burling, the Titanic was a symbol, but a symbol of what? It was a symbol of capitalism. It was a symbol of wealth. It was a symbol of power. The Titanic guys is similar to people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos trying to go to the moon. It's a sign that we are rich, we are powerful. Look what we've produced. All the workers on the Titanic were poor working class people. But the people that were paying money to go on the Titanic, they were rich upper class. They were rich capitalists. A poor person couldn't even get onto the ship. So therefore, the ship was a symbol of capitalism. So when Mr. Burling says unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable, he is not only saying that the ship can't go down, he is saying capitalism can't be defeated. It is absolutely unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. But then guys, this quote as a whole, you can also call it foreshadowing. Because what happens, what happens, what happens? Just the way the ship sinks, so does capitalism. Because Inspector Ghoul comes and he grabs Mr. Burling's head and he shoves it down the toilet and he pulls down the lever and flushes it. Not really, guys, but you get what I'm saying. What you want to say here, guys, is that this quote shows you how Mr. Burling was in love with the idea of power. Mr. Burling was in love with the idea of never being defeated. But just the way the Titanic created a false confidence Mr. Berling creates a false confidence only for the inspector to come and defeat him. All right, guys, quote number four. And this is an interesting quote. This quote is said by Gerald. And the first thing I want you guys to do, guys, is link this quote to patriarchy. Look at how he views her, young and fresh. I want to really focus here, guys, on the adjective fresh. And you can even go and look at the adjective young. The way he speaks about her here, guys, the way he speaks about her, he speaks about her as though she is a piece of meat. That's how he speaks about her. He speaks about her as though she is an object. And therefore, guys, this quote is perfect when it comes to looking at how men viewed women. They viewed them as a piece of meat. Now, what do you do to a piece of meat? You do whatever you want to it. It's powerless. It's at your mercy. And the fact that Gerald says this about Eva Smith, Daisy Renton, it honestly shows how these men viewed women. He's not hiding his views. In a capitalist, patriarchal society, this was normal. It's not as though uh, uh, Mr. Burling says, what, really? Young and fresh? How, how dare you? It slides under the table. It's normal. Even the female characters don't question it. Therefore, it shows you guys how it was an accepted norm that this was how women were treated. Very good quote, guys, to talk about gender. Very good quote to talk about power. Very good quote for injustice. Very good quote to talk about the idea of what capitalism produced. It produced people like that. Because as I said earlier, rich and patriarchy produce people that had no respect for women. All right, guys, these are four quotes that can be applied to lots of different questions. And there are loads of other quotes that you can use. But these four guys are easy to remember and they can be used on the day of your exam in lots of different ways. They all have context. They've all got language. They've all got structure. They've all got things that you can discuss. One more thing before I forget, one more thing. I can't call this video everything about Inspector Calls if I don't give you everything. What's missing behind me? What's missing behind me? Form. I haven't got a quote that analyzes form, but I do have a quote that analyzes form. Shop. That's it. One word. 
I'm going to use the, that one word. And all I want you guys to talk about as form is the idea that this is a stage direction. Sharp is a stage direction. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head, but sharp is repeated at least three, four times in the entire play. And it's always talking about how the inspector either acts or speaks. So, for example, when he knocks on the door, it says that it was a sharp ring. And then when he speaks to Mr. Burling, it says he, he, um, it is sharp and it cuts in. And what you want to repeat here, guys, and what you want to talk about here is the idea. I said it earlier. Mr. Burling is the tree. Inspector has the axe. Cutting, cutting, cutting. Guys, you know what? You can even take it further. Also, a stage direction that says that the inspector is cutting in when Mr. Burling talks. These two quotes are lovely when it comes to form because form is when you analyse the idea of what is the text. Now, our text is a play. What does a play have that other texts don't have? Stage directions. And you can use this quote, guys, any of these, for the idea of the inspector taking the power, cutting bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. And if you want to make a point that when does the tree fall? When does Mr. Burling fall? I would argue, guys, it's in Act 3 when Mr. Burling says, I'd give thousands, yes, thousands. Don't underestimate that quote. Mr. Burling does change for a split second. He says, I'd give thousands, yes, thousands. For somebody like Mr. Burling, that is massive. He's giving away his most important possession. Now look, does he literally give the money? No, but the sentiment is what is important. Ms. The inspector has chopped away so much that by that point, he is absolutely defeated. He's laid out flat. And that is Mr. Burling by the end, but you can use the stage directions, cutting in and shop. Now guys, if you're thinking, sir, 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 what if these don't fit? In the beginning of the play, in the stage directions, there is so much to talk about. It talks about how Sheila Burling is young and pretty, I believe. It talks about how Eric Burling is half shy and half assertive. It talks about how Mrs. Burling is a cold woman. It talks about how Mr. Burling is a heavy looking man. It talks about Gerald Croft as a uh, young, attractive chap, the typical bachelor in the town. My point being, guys, there's lots you can take, lots you can take. But what I'm giving you on the board, let's say you can't remember all those quotes and you need five that you can apply to lots of different questions. These five are there ready for you to use. Because don't remember guys, that in the exam for inspector calls it is multiple choice. You pick either one question or you pick the other. All right guys, we've been over the entire play. We've been over context. We've been over key quotes with structure, with form and language. Now let's go over the exam. Let's look at the past paper questions since June 2017. So in the first exam in June 2017, the question that came up was about Mrs. Burling being unlikable. And the other question in June 2017 was inspector and how society could be improved. Then guys, we had in June 2018, we had Eric and his attitudes towards himself and others. And then we had Priestley exploring social class in the play. And that was in June 2018. In June 2019, guys, we had the theme of selfishness. And the other question in June 2019 was Sheila and the lessons that she learns. Then, guys, in November 2020, which is COVID, we had Mr. Burling, who only cares for himself. Then, guys, in 2021, which is COVID again, we had how Priestley presents society as unfair and how Gerald explores responsibility. And then guys, in June 2022, which is last year, we had Eric who learned about society and we had inequality. In our exam, we know that the, for the inspector calls question, we spend 45 minutes on this particular question. And for this question, guys, we are spending five minutes planning and we are spending 40 minutes writing. And in this exam, guys, we should know that we are marked on AO1, 
we are marked on AO2 and we are marked on AO3. AO2 guys essentially looks at how you analyze the effect of the following, how you analyze the effect of language devices, how you analyze the effect of structural devices and how you analyze form. AO3 guys, it looks at context and context that I went over earlier was Freud, was capitalism and was patriarchy. And then we looked at AO, well, we're gonna, well then it's AO1 and AO1 guys essentially marks you on your point and it marks you on your reference, which is your quote. Now, all of this, what you see here, AO1, AO2, AO3, we don't have to do all three of these. One or two are enough. All of these must be done within the 40-minute essay where we are going to be writing four pretzel paragraphs. But if you want to do PL, if you want to do Peter, if you want to do PL, that is absolutely fine, guys. You do whatever you're comfortable with as long as you do AO1, AO2, and AO3, the essay and the paragraph structure you follow is entirely up to you, but the structure that I follow is four pretzel paragraphs. Now, how do we include all of this in a pretzel paragraph? Now, in our exam, guys, we are looking to produce four paragraphs, and all four paragraphs are from the whole text. Because for the inspector calls questions, unlike literature paper one, we don't get an extract. So all four paragraphs must be done from the top of your head, must be done by memory. That is why learning quotes for this exam is even more important. But how may you go about planning an entire essay? It's the same plan that we've done previously, guys. To ensure that we hit the entire mark scheme, in paragraph one, when you pick your technique, try to analyze a language device. And when you zoom in, zoom in to a noun, zoom in to a verb, zoom in to an adjective, or zoom in to an adverb. Then we have paragraph number two. And in paragraph number two, do the same thing. Analyze a language device. And when you zoom in, zoom in to a verb, zoom in to an adjective, zoom in to an adverb, or zoom in to a noun. And it is in this paragraph after the effect, before we zoom in, where we include our first bit of context. Then we move on to paragraph number three. In paragraph number three, guys, try to analyze a structural device. And when you zoom in, zoom in to form. The best thing to do is zoom in and talk, sorry, is talk about a stage direction, which is a nice, easy way to tick off the box for form. Then for paragraph four, if you follow this structure, by the time you get to paragraph four, you've now done all of AO2, you've now done all of AO3, and you've hopefully done AO1 because you're gonna have a point and reference naturally. So by the end of paragraph three, we've ticked off the entire mark scheme. So for paragraph number four, when it comes to your technique, you pick whatever you are comfortable with. And when it comes to zooming in, again, you zoom in to whatever you want. But when I say whatever you want, I mean either a language device or a structural device or an element of form. But guys, this is an overall plan of how you structure an essay for an inspector calls. This will ensure that you tick off the entire mark scheme. Guys, what I'll do is I'll plan one paragraph for you guys. And I'll plan paragraph number three so you can see how I would embed a structural device into this particular essay. So let's say we are doing a question on equality or inequality more like. So let's say we're doing, for example, uh, a question looking at inequality from last year's exam. How would I plan one paragraph on that particular question? First things first, guys, I will use the quote cutting in, which is a stage direction. And my technique will be foreshadowing, which is a structural technique. And my zooming in will be the fact that this is a stage direction. And what's my point? How does this show inequality? Guys, I will talk about in this quote the idea of how the inspector is trying to bridge the gap. 
he is the superhero. He is the man who is trying to defend. He is the man that is trying to reduce the inequality. And there you have one paragraph planned. Now, in my exam, I would never plan my effects and I would never plan my link. The reason I would advise people not to plan their effect and their link is because normally you should already know what you're going to say about what you're picking. Otherwise, don't pick it. So you don't have to necessarily write down your effect. It should be in your head anyway. But if you want to write it down, you can. The link, all we're doing is linking it back to the point. So guys, in this paragraph, let me explain how what would happen. I will talk about how uh, inequality is presented as there being a massive divide. However, it is the inspector who is there to bridge the gap, who is there to reduce the, uh, the divide. This can be seen by the way he treats Mr. Burling. Rather than worshipping Mr. Burling, the inspector treats Mr. Burling and humble Mr. Burling as he should be. This can be seen from the quote cutting in. Here the writer is foreshadowing it's the idea of chopping away at the tree. He's bringing Mr. Burling back down to his level. Once I've explained that, then I would say furthermore, it is very important that this is a stage direction because all the other characters can see it. He's cutting in, he's disturbing Mr. Burling while he's talking in front of every other character. That's the effect of it being a stage direction. Everyone can see what is happening. Therefore, not only is he making Mr. Burling less powerful, he's reducing the power of Mr. Burling in the eyes of all of the other characters. Therefore, as you can see, and link it back to the top. That is how I would piece that paragraph together. All right, guys, that is how you'd plan an entire essay. And here is a specific plan for one paragraph. Here is your exam on the board. Do not forget, guys, what is happening on English Literature Paper 2. 45 minutes, 40 minutes writing, 5 minutes planning. And please make sure you have elements of AO1 and AO2 and AO3 throughout your essay. Guys, this video, I hope you have found it beneficial. I went over the entire play. I went over context. I went over quotes. I went over the past papers and then went through the paper and how you plan an entire essay and then a particular paragraph. As always, guys, it's been Mr. Everything English. Peace.